Hello all, welcome to the Network Pen Testing course at Pen Tester Academy. Now in this video, we will look at DLL hijacking basics. So DLLs or dynamic link libraries as they are called is the most common way by which Windows applications share code. Now the whole idea behind DLLs is to make applications more modular. So how does a DLL work? So here is a demo DLL and this DLL would have many functions which might be implemented inside. Some of which would be what are called exportable to the outside world. Now exportable really means that applications can go ahead and call these functions by loading the DLL. Now there is an optional main function called the DLL main function which a DLL implements uh, if it wants to do you know any uh, startup activity. Of course this is optional and you can ignore it uh, if you want. Now apart from DLL main, depending on the DLL's functionality, there are other functions written in as well. Now an exe typically loads a DLL from disk using load library and then finds the appropriate function it wants to run by using get proc address. So using load library and get proc address, uh, pretty much DLLs are loaded in memory and their functions are made accessible. Now, if I were to broadly classify DLLs, I would classify them into system DLLs, which is provided by the Windows system. And these pretty much do, you know, all the bare bone basic functionality, which most executables might require, such as the Winsock DLL, which gives basic internet connectivity, such as you know send receive connect bind etc and there are many many other dlls such as kernel 32 user 32 and so on and so forth apart from the system dlls the application developer himself might want to modularize his application and split functionality across multiple dlls now these dlls are what are application dlls and typically ship with the application. Now the question arises if an exe is going through the process with the help of the Windows loader to load and to find different functions in a DLL then even before that how does it even find the DLL? Now this is where on Windows there is a default DLL search order. Now this would begin with the directory from where the application is loaded, which is where the binary resides, followed by the current directory from where the user or whoever is executing it. And if it's not found there, then we move on our search to the system directory, the 16-bit systems directory, the Windows directory, and finally to all directories which may be listed in our search path which as all of you know is an environment variable. Now if an option called safe DLL search mode is enabled, which typically came in uh, when DLL hijacking became very prominent, then the default order changes and the key difference is that the current directory from where the application is run is actually put much later in the search than it was in the previous case. Uh, this of course manages to stop some DLL hijacking attacks, but definitely not all. So how would we go about finding vulnerable applications where we can do DLL injection? So uh, DLL hijacking, I'm sorry. So the whole idea is basically when an application loads up, it is going to try and find the different DLLs using the search order which we just spoke about. Now in many cases a target DLL might be completely unavailable or might be much further down in the search path. Now if a target DLL is unavailable for some reason 
then it is trivial for us to go ahead and do a DLL hijack. In the cases that the target DLL is available but is much further below in the search path which we discussed, then as an attacker, if we manage to go ahead and store our malicious DLL with the same name somewhere higher up in the search path, then the application would end up loading our malicious DLL. Now for this demo, we'll be using a binary called CAV Remover, which is really a Kaspersky product remover. Uh, the original research on this was done by Astro Baby. You can read that link as well and get another perspective of how he solved it. Uh, so with this, let's actually move on to the demo. Now I'm going to be doing the demo on a Windows 7 machine. I have the CAV Remover binary in here. Apart from the CAV Remover binary, we need the Sys Internals suite of tools. Uh, particularly Procmon, which allows us to go ahead and monitor different events happening in different processes. So once you've downloaded the Sys Internals tools and the CAV Remover binary, go ahead and run Procmon. So it looks like this one is already running. Let me close this. Let's restart. I'm going to remove some of the older filters which I had added for my own purpose. Just do a quick reset on the filters and do an OK. Now for people who have never used Procmon, you can clearly see there are a ton of events. Now Procmon goes ahead and displays all the events happening system wide. Uh, these could be registry events, read write file events, a ton of them and it shows you these events when they happen the binary which made them happen and a lot of information so procmon will actually come in handy to do dynamic analysis in which when our binary runs we can actually figure out the different dlls it is trying to load and then we are going to zero down on when the binary fails to find a dll in its different search paths. So let's do this. And as you can see, Procmon has like a ton of events. Let me just restart the application a bit. It's expected to have thousands of events, by the way. Now, let's open CAV Remover. And let's hit Accept presented in the screen where we can now remove this product. So let's go back in here. Let's add a filter. Now let's go ahead and choose the actual binary using process name. Let's do a process name is and then select cav remover. Here it is. Add the filter, apply it. Now all the events which we see inside Procmon are from CAV Remover. But as you can clearly notice, there are tons and tons and tons of these events going on. The one which we are interested in, of course, is related to the DLLs. And this is where we need to only look at events where the path contains a DLL. So let's go ahead and add this. Let's say path contains DLL. Let's add this, apply the filter, and now we see a bunch of them. Now, if you notice, in a lot of cases, we see successes, and we find that in some cases, there is a name not found. Now, this is very important. The name not founds are really the ones where uh, your binary is trying to load the DLL but couldn't find it in one of the locations it expected it to be in. So let's actually now apply an additional filter on result and say result contains name not found. So add this filter, apply it and now you would actually find only the ones for which the name was not found. Fantastic.
can see a couple of them in here. Uh, cav remover, of course, has been tried in various different places. Now, if you recall, the program ran from the desktop, and from an attacker's perspective, it's very easy to package a DLL in the same directory as the binary and send it to a victim, right? Uh, this is also very easy when you look at installers and stuff like that, which could be packaged together. Now we can clearly see that uh, we tried to go ahead and do a create file call on cavremover.dll. Double click this event. And if you notice, really we tried to actually do an open on it. Desired access is really read. And we found that the DLL was nowhere to be found. So this seems to be a very good candidate. So what if we could create a simple malicious DLL called cavremoverenu.dll and just do something very basic in it and put it in the same directory as cavremover and start the program? What would really end up happening? So let's... Go back to our VM or rather our slides. Now we could use different programs to create a DLL. I am using the simplest one. Now if you recall I said that when a DLL is loaded DLL main is first run. Now if you just go to MSDN you can find this sample code. I have just picked up something from ExploitDB and in this case DLL main in turn calls dll underscore mll which just puts out a message box now keep in mind that from our perspective the only important argument to dll name is the fdw reason and depending on whether you are being now invoked for the process attaching detaching or a thread attaching or detaching you could do different stuff in here so what i've done is i've taken this source code and I've put it inside my Kali machine so that we can use it. So here is hijack.c, the exact same program. Let's now compile this using the Ming compiler into a DLL. So it should be simple, hyphen O. Let's call this hijack.dll for now. And this is basically a shared library. So let's run file on this. And we can clearly see it's a P32 DLL. Now let's run a web server on the same directory so that we can download this into our Windows machine. Let's refresh this. Let's download hijack.dll to the desktop. And let's close this application. And let's restart the app now. We can see hijack.dll. But before we do that, let's rename the DLL to cavremoverenu.dll. So let's go in here, click on it, change the name to Cav remover enu dot dll right hopefully uh, I think I have, may have a typo cav remove no I think there's a typo cav remover enu Yep, looks okay. I think the last one maybe may have been fine as well. Too many R's in there. Hmm. So now let's run this. And there you go. If you notice, the DLL hijack message has come in. Let's click in OK. And that's it, right? Keep in mind, of course, that because you're hijacking some functionality, the executable itself might not run, right? And also at the very same time, not all DLLs would lend themselves to using DLL main in such a way. We have not done uh, an actual code level analysis to check which DLLs do what functionality and what happens when they are loaded, right? So a lot of times you may end up getting crashes as well. 
So purely with this high level dynamic analysis, you might have to try different DLLs. Uh, of course, we still have Procmon running. So we have a lot of events which have been generated by this run. You aren't worried if you notice 623 is when we ended the first run and everything below that is really of the current run. Uh, you could actually try different DLLs. You could try, let's say the next one, msls31.dll. Let's try this one. Let's rename it. msls31.dll. There you go, we managed to do a hijack again. And this time around, interestingly, the application worked. Doesn't seem to be an important DLL. And just like what Astro Baby pointed out, you also have MSI or DLL, which you can try. So let me rename this to MSI or DLL. Let's run. You can clearly see, depending on where the DLLs are being uh, loaded, the hijacked message is pretty much coming in different places, right? Okay. Looks like the application is now stuck. Okay, there you go. Uh, you could also have places where you might see crashes, right? So, for example, at the very top in here, msimg32.dll, right? I couldn't get this working with this one. We're just renaming it msimg32.dll. And there you go, right? Uh, the procedure entry point alpha blend could not be located in the dynamic blah 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 which means there are other checks happening uh, you know which definitely we aren't taking care of right so with this high level analysis of course there's going to be a little trial and error uh, but most of the times it does seem to work if you're one of those people who hate sitting with ida and doing actual reverse engineering right okay fantastic so hopefully you enjoyed this video and in the next video, what we're going to look at is if we can now package Metapreter inside our DLL and we're going to learn some valuable lessons when dealing with DLL main. So thank you very much. And if you're enjoying Pentester Academy, please do recommend us to your friends and colleagues in the InfoSec community. Thank you.